The train was delayed. People pressed into me at every angle, backpacks and purses and totes. The smell was an obscene combo. Someone nearby hadn't taken a shower. Someone else ate cumin at 8 a.m. apparently. I felt nauseous, a bad taste in my mouth, but I ignored it. The train blared its horn as it pulled in and people backed away from the yellow safety line. The seats were all taken. I was lucky to grab a pole somewhere in the middle. I hovered over a wheezing old woman in a seat squeezed on either side by a kid in an anime button-down and a -a six-and-a-half-foot man, tattoos under his polo shirt like he retired from punk and took up consulting. My headphones played an audiobook. I closed my eyes and retreated inward. I smoked before, just three puffs before my shower, but enough so I would have a faint high for the first hour of my shitty job. The wheezing woman in front of me coughed hard without covering her mouth. Rude. I frowned, turned up my volume, and prayed I wouldn't be disturbed. My prayer was not answered. A heavy weight fell onto me, the ex-punk. With my eyes closed, I imagined someone had shoved their way onto the train, toppling a couple nearby people. But the weight wasn't moving. I opened my eyes to see the flickering eyelids of the ex-punk, his head lolling on a rubber neck. I moved, and he slid off me. Held up by the dense crowd, he collapsed like a building in demolition, falling straight down. His head hit the pole, then rested on the toe of my boot. I stared down at him and felt the entire train car, like me, casually take notice. What had changed? And was this good or bad? Bad, came the response. There was a frenzy of thought and pressed so close to everyone, it was like an electric current zipping from one passenger to another in sudden alarm. Stop the train! A nearby woman shouted. I should have been the one. He hit me after all, but I just stared at him dazed. A man collapsed! Everyone at once stepped away, gave the man space to unfurl his angular bundle of limbs. He wasn't moving. Was he alive? I got on my knees, and his foot fell from my boot to the rubber train floor. I shook him slightly, but there was no response. I tried shaking him more. Don't do that! Someone farther away shouted. First I was desperate to help, now I was embarrassed. I bent my ear to see if I could hear his breath, but only heard a narrator explaining the interior of a living spaceship my audiobook was still playing. The kid in an anime shirt joined me on my knees and put his finger to the man's throat. Is this the right spot? He asked. We were amateurs. The train pulled into the next station and the doors opened. Most of the car emptied, but I and everyone else the man fell onto all stayed. I couldn't explain why, but I had a role in this. I unplugged my headphones and only then heard people screaming. Does he have a pulse? I asked. I think so, the anime kid said. Do you have something for his head? I took off my winter hat and handed it over. The woman who yelled before was yelling again. Is there a doctor? Is there a doctor? It was then I smelled vomit. The man was shaking. His pulse is gone, the kid said. Is there a doctor? The woman screamed. People crowded the door outside the train car to watch, and from the back, the herd began to part. A thin woman with a baby strapped to her chest pushed her way through the people and came on board. I'm a doctor, she said, and at once everyone felt bad. It's it's hard to say why. As a unit, we were unable to provide, I suppose, and now this woman, already taking care of a baby, no less, had this added to her commute. The wheezing woman who had been sitting offered to hold the baby and the doctor agreed. The newcomer joined our crowd around the ex-punk, giving her baby to the stranger. At the train door, an attendant came by, his radio buzzing with feedback. Man out, not sure what it is, he said into a mic. Is it a seizure? He asked the kneeling mother. Yes, ugh, she said, wiping her hands on the man's jacket. Does, does anyone have hand sanitizer? I did, and found it in my backpack at once. She took a squirt and handed it back, sniffing the crisp alcohol from her rubbing hands. I think he's dead. The body began to spasm. Are you sure? I asked. No one paid attention to me. I wasn't the lead helper. Heck, I wasn't good for much besides a hat. Two other train attendants arrived. They grabbed the fallen man by the arms and legs, though he still spasmed, mouth foaming and skin turning dark and speckled. The wheezing woman gave the doctor her baby back. The man was out of the train when the doors closed. My hat lay on the ground where his head once was. I picked it up, but didn't wear it. The train lurched to a start, surprising everyone left on board. 
At the next stop, most of my fellow witnesses left, and new people came on board. I hated the newcomers. They didn't know what had just happened. A guy said, Jesus took long enough. Over the next week, I beat myself up for being so unprepared. I was in the Girl Scouts. I knew a little CPR. I swore I would do better next time. I had a chance sooner than I thought. A week after the last incident, another person collapsed into me on the train. This time they were standing directly behind me, slid down my back, head knocking the back of my knees. I knew what it was before she hit the ground. Her blonde hair was still wet from the shower, turning her denim jacket dark blue around the shoulders, now streaking the train floor. Her head rattled like the end of a maraca, her eyelids fluttering and teeth clacking hard against her tongue. This time I was the first to respond. I dropped to one knee. Can you respond? Hello, can you respond? Yes, she spat, then in staccato bursts. I I think I just fainted. Then she calmed. The other passengers gave us space. She tried to get up, and I helped her. The moment my hand touched her back, she started shaking again, so I set her quickly in a seat. The train had stopped, and passengers were holding the doors open, shouting, Hold the train! Hold the train! Has this happened before? Are you on any medications? No, I just... I need... Then her eyes fluttered and her head fell back. She shook in her seat, and a clear froth of vomit poured down her chin like turning on the tap. It soaked down her chest, crotch, and onto the seat. We need medical, I announced, and the other members of my impromptu team nodded as though to say, already on it. The woman slumped in her seat and said, I think I'm going to throw up. A nearby 20-something woman pulled a book out of a plastic bag and handed the bag to her. Politely, everyone in the vicinity turned their heads to let the woman vomit in peace. I looked out the window at pissed-off faces of oncoming passengers wondering what the hell it was this time. I listened to a hose spray of vomit gather with water fountain sounds in the clear plastic sack. Men in blue medical uniforms ran down the train platform as passengers pointed them to the car in question. When they came on, they nodded to me as though I was her attending physician. I discharged my patient. They had carried her off the train. The other passengers nodded at me. Good work, they seemed to say. Thank God you were here. A woman forced her way onto the train and sat in the vomit before anyone could stop her. I appreciated what I had learned from the last time to this latest incident. I found myself fantasizing that if it happened again, I would spring into action like a natural. Imagine my surprise when it did happen, not even two days later. This time it was a person seated in front of me, so at least they didn't fall into me. She was in her 70s with thick black glasses and a red dotted wraparound dress. We had connected eyes, and I gave her a little smile. No teeth, though. My gums had been bleeding that morning. After I smiled, she began seizing. Before her head flopped onto her neighbor's shoulder, I was pulling at the man's jacket. She's having a seizure, I said. Give her room. My hat was under her head. I had a bag for her vomit ready and a full water bottle in case she needed any. This time, no one else made much of an effort to help. I had it covered, the whole train car could tell. As I shouted for people to alert a medical team and ensure the conductor kept the train in the station, I saw respect in the eyes of my fellow commuters. Don't worry, I told the woman. You're in good hands. We are taking this train to West 4th, the conductor announced over the PA. We have a sick passenger on board. At the next stop, I helped the woman out the door, and one of the medics recognized me from the last time. You again? He laughed, and I made a mug as though to say, guilty as charged. I spent a couple days wondering whether I should go back to school, enter nursing, or become a paramedic. I wondered when the next person would fall, and wondered how exactly I was so good at being there. Maybe I had a superpower. A week later, I was on my way to work. I stood once again in a crowded train, pressed to a metal pole by backpacks and a man with a bike. I hadn't smoked that morning, thinking I would need to be ready. I could feel it. I had a sense of what was going to happen before it did, and watched my neighbors for the signs. Shaky knees, unsupported craniums on rubber necks. Everyone seemed perfectly fine, as far as I could tell. Maybe I was wrong, I figured. But when I rubbed my eyes, my vision went spotty, like a TV losing reception. My ears began to ring. 
My tongue was swollen, throat dry. I didn't realize I had collapsed until I felt someone trying to pick me up, heard the quiet commotion of confused, shocked commuters. They didn't know what to do. Someone began shaking me, and my head sloshed like a carbonated soda. Stop! I tried to say. Leave her be! Someone else shouted, while another held the door open, calling out, Someone fainted! I smelled my urine before I felt any wetness and tried to swallow. Drool leaked out of my mouth. Get me a bag. I fought through my overlarge tongue. I... I know what to... I felt vomit spill out of my mouth onto my cardigan. And then all I saw was black. I woke up in a hospital bed sometime later. I was attached to an IV drip, a heart monitor, and was wholly nude. I looked down. And shaved. My clothes were in the corner. It looked like they had been sliced off my body and thrown there. My purse was missing. I, I tried to sit up, but was far too weak. It smelled like an airplane inside this room. Recycled air. I noticed the walls were entirely clear plastic. A larger room obscured outside it. I realized this was not a hospital. Not a traditional one, anyway. Panic took me as the voice rang in on the PA. Can you respond? Yes, I said. Words like rusty creaks. Good. We're going to enter. Don't get up or anything. That last line was almost sarcastic. Or was I imagining it? A minute later, three people arrived. I think a man and two women. It was hard to tell through the radiation suits. They did not enter the immediate plastic of my room, but stood blurrily outside. The tallest of the three lifted a walkie-talkie to his mouth. Good afternoon, he said. Excuse us for not entering, but um, I think you'll understand soon enough. Okay. Has anyone close to you become sick recently? I thought on this. What, what do you mean by close by you? Like... The shorter one spoke up. In your physical vicinity. I couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> now that you mention it. Yeah, a few, on the subway. This promptly got the three of them chattering. No one clicked a walkie-talkie, so I couldn't hear. Finally, the tall one spoke again. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. These incidents. One was this week, right? One two days before that? And another one a couple weeks before. They conversed privately. Thank you. The short one spoke. That answers a number of questions. They began to leave. Hey! I wanted to... I tried to stand, but instead fell out of the bed and landed hard on the floor. They did not come back. I've been in bed for days now. After I gathered enough strength to climb back in, anyhow, no one would come into the plastic room. I've used the bathroom on the bed, unable to get up to leave. Given the sweat and bile I'm leaking anyway, I figure it doesn't matter. I'm thin enough to see my ribs now, and I'm fairly certain I can hear my heartbeat through the skin. It sounds erratic, like a drummer falling asleep. More people have come to my plastic enclosure, all in radiation suits, some standing as far back in the room as they can. No one speaks to me, but I listen to them. That's how I know I don't have long. I probably could have guessed. Two more days. Someone said yesterday. I could tell they were important because there was a big American flag stamped on their chest. Yeah, I thought. Sounds about right. I can see through my eyelids they're so thin. When I moved my hand earlier, not all the skin moved with it. One of the people yesterday, I'll never forget their voice. Sounded like a French accent maybe, just not a voice I'm used to hearing. Anyway, it was what he said. Like a typhoid Mary. He was speaking about me. I thought about those words for a while. I used to wonder how I found all those sick people. I used to think it was just right place, right time. But I was wrong. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. This story must be told.